Welcome to Oil & Gas with Energy Law Prof. Right now, we're going to do a quick preview of several concepts that will come up again and again throughout our oil and gas course. So we're going to talk about the different kinds of oil and gas interests there are in the United States, and it'll just be a very brief introduction to each of these interests. So the most common type that we've talked about is that fee interest. So we know that because of the rule of ad coelum, if you are a landowner in the United States, if you haven't sold your minerals, they still belong to you. So that common fee interest would give you both the surface and the minerals below them. Now, you can sell your mineral interest to someone else, so they may own the mineral interest and they may own the executive right, which is the right to lease those minerals or choose how they're developed. We'll talk about that. You could also have a leasehold interest. So commonly, if an oil and gas company is going to develop the land that uh, your, your minerals, they are going to take a lease with you. You will be, as a landowner, the lessor. They will be the lessee, the oil and gas company, and the develop under that leasehold interest. The surface interest is what's left over after you sell your minerals. Uh, surface interest is a little bit of a misnomer because it includes really everything in that land other than the minerals that you sold, as we'll see later in the course. And then a royalty interest is a share of production from a given piece of land, and we'll see that the lessor, the landowner, commonly receives a royalty interest in return for their lease. So first, let's talk about this mineral interest and the accompanying executive right. So when you have the mineral interest in a piece of land, maybe you've purchased it from the surface owner, you have the right to use that land to look at for oil and gas and to produce it. That is often called the right to work the property, to choose how it's developed. One of the most important choices you get to make is uh, to lease the land when to lease, how to lease. As we'll see, there are a lot of decisions to be made there. And so we call that the executive right, the right to choose how the land is developed. Once you sign that lease with an oil and gas company, you're gonna be able to keep the benefits under that lease. As we'll see, typically you get the most money for your land with a royalty, another kind of oil and gas interest that we'll mention. And of course, depending on whether you are in an ownership in place state or not, you have a different kind of right, at least in how we describe it in that oil and gas. So in an ownership in place, taste like, uh, place state like Texas, you're going to own that oil and gas in the ground subject to the rule of capture, which is to say if your neighbor starts producing oil and gas, they might draw off that oil and gas to their well. Okay, as we said, the surface interest is another interest. That's what happens when you've sold away your mineral interest. And so really, it's everything that remains after that mineral interest is severed, and that includes the non-mineral portions of the subsurface. So although we say it's a surface interest, really it includes the subsurface as well, just not the minerals. So it excludes also those minerals that are part of the surface. So if you have one of those oil, uh, that oil actually sitting on the surface it, back in the old days, those oil seeps was often how they found oil, uh, oil deposits underneath the earth. That's going to uh, belong to the mineral owner as well, even though it's on the surface. So the surface estate is really everything but the minerals in reality. Okay, if you are a landowner and you have oil and gas on your land, the most common way that you make money from that oil and gas is by leasing your land to an oil and gas company that develops it and in return gives you money. So the leasehold interest is your mineral interest as a landowner that as transferred by the lease. Here's what a very typical lease would look like. So typically, the lessor, the landowner, receives some money up front. That's the bonus, and that could be a fair amount of money, could be not so much money, it just depends on the situation. But if you're gonna get rich on oil and gas, it's typically not from the bonus, it's from the royalty. Historically, that royalty share that the landowner received from production on his or her land was one eighth share of production. So the oil and gas company that's producing the oil and gas actually gets to keep the vast majority of production. Historically, they got to keep about seven eighths of that production. You might ask, well, if it's your land, why does the oil and gas company get to keep most of it? That's because, of course, they are spending all the money to drill the well. In fact, 
uh, for many decades, most wells that you drilled did not produce oil. So on the very few where that they were able to hit oil and receive oil, they had to make profit to pay for all the wells that didn't pay off. So typically in, uh, for decades, the landowner only received a one-eighth share of production, but even so, that landowner could get very wealthy just on that one-eighth share of production. Now finally, that lease isn't necessarily going to last forever. So the typical lease, as we'll see, lasts uh, for an initial term of years where the oil and gas company is going to be able to look for oil and gas. But if they start producing oil and gas, it is then going to last as long as oil and gas is produced. That means that at some point it will end if oil and gas stops being produced and then the landowner receives the reversion back. Okay, what does the lessee, the oil and gas company, receive? The lessee oil and gas company gets the exclusive right to produce oil and gas from that land for some period of time. And that basically gives the oil and gas company time to look for oil and gas. So as an example, I've said five years. It could be three years, could only be one year. But then if they hit oil and gas and start producing it, they're going to be able to keep that lease as long thereafter as oil and gas is produced. And a well, once it starts producing oil, can easily continue producing oil for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. There are oil and gas wells that have been operating for 100 years. And so the oil and gas company may have a very long-term interest in that lease. The principal compensation, of course, that the oil and gas company gets is it gets to keep everything it doesn't owe the landowner in terms of a royalty. So it pays all the costs, but it in the past typically kept seven eighths share of production. Nowadays, that typically be a little bit smaller, but still it usually receives the bulk of the oil and gas that's actually produced on the land. Okay, let's talk about that royalty interest a little bit more that the landowner receives. So that is a share of production or production revenues, and it doesn't include production costs. So the landowner gets one eighth of production no matter how much it costs to produce that oil and gas. In fact, that oil and gas company may have lost money the whole time, never get its money back, but the landowner still gets a one eighth share of production. And what that means is that typically the landowner wants as much production on his or her land as possible, whereas the oil and gas company has to think a little bit more carefully about what it would cost to produce. So from the landowner's perspective, I don't care what it costs you, oil and gas company, produce as much as possible. The oil and gas company has to think about those costs. Now, so the royalty interest, it's important to understand that if all you have is a royalty interest, you know, that's what you have as a landowner after you have leased your land to an oil and gas company, you no longer have the right to choose how the land is developed. That right to work the property uh, is with the oil and gas company at that time. Obviously, you can't lease it either. We'll see that not only do landowners have royalties, but sometimes other parties can have a royalty that is a share of the production from a land. But that right to uh, a share of production doesn't give them the right to lease the property. It's not like a mineral interest. It's just a share of production. And they also don't get the right to other lease benefits. So just because you get, let's say, one half of all royalty on a given piece of land, that doesn't give you one half of the bonus and other benefits that there might be under the lease. Uh, finally, as we said, stereotypical lesser or, in other words, the landowner's royalty is one eighth. Nowadays, it varies typically higher than that traditional one eighth. Now, as I suggested, landowners are not the only ones that have a royalty interest. It's going to be the most common royalty we discuss, but there are other kinds of royalty interests that are very important. So that lessor's landowner's royalties, the most important, let's talk about a couple other kinds of royalties. Overriding royalty. So let's say one oil and gas company takes a lease and so they are entitled to seven eighths of production from that land. But let's say they decide they don't want to develop it, but they sell that lease to another company that uh, they th is more eager to develop that land. That oil and gas company that transfers the lease might say, you know what, you can have the lease, but give me one sixteenth share of the oil and gas that you find on that land. 
Now, what does that do? That new company that now controls the lease no longer gets the full seven eighths like the original company. They have to pay one eighth to the landowner and they have to pay one sixteenth to that other oil and gas company that gave up the lease. That's called an overriding royalty. It's created out of the lessee's interest. That seven eighths, you divide off another fraction for someone else, by the way, you can do the math as an exercise at home, but that would leave the new company developing the lease with just 13 sixteenths because they would give one eighth, two sixteenths to the landowner and one sixteenth to that overriding royalty holder, the company that originally took that lease. So an overriding royalty, we'll talk more about them, but it is created out of the lessee's interest, out of whatever that oil and gas company that originally leased the land what its fraction of production was. Okay, another kind of royalty interest is a non-participating royalty. That is not created out of a lease. That's just created by the mineral owner. So imagine that a mineral owner believes that they have some oil and gas on their land. They don't want to lease it just yet, but they want to make some money from that. Well, they could sell a share of production. They could say to somebody, you know what? You can purchase a one one hundredth interest in the oil and gas in my land for just a million dollars. It would obviously depend on what the land was, but that's a non-participating royalty interest. It doesn't have anything to do with the lease. Another very common way for non-participating royalty interest to be created is, let's imagine that you're selling some land in Texas. For Texans, when we sell land, we know there's often oil and gas, and so you might worry, uh-oh, what if there's oil and gas under my land? So I'm selling the land for agricultural purposes, but what if maybe there was a fortune under that land that I'm giving away? Well, one thing that I could do is say, you know what? I'm selling you the land, but I want to keep for myself a one half interest in all royalties that are produced from that property in the future. And so now I'm going to get one half of whatever the landowner's royalty is in the future. Now, again, that gives me a share of production on the land, but it's not connected to any lease. I am a non-participating royalty interest holder. Nothing to do with a lease. I no longer live on that property, but I'm entitled to a share of its production. That's what a non-participating royalty is. Uh, here's that example. It's independent of a lease, but it could be measured by a lease royalty. As in the example I gave, if you had a one-half interest in any present or future lease royalty, that would be a non-participating royalty interest.